Where do engineers and designers at companies like BMW, NASA, and Bosch get custom manufactured parts fast? Zometry. With Zometry, anyone with a 3D model can get pricing and order parts thanks to Zometry's instant quoting engine. Access dozens of manufacturing processes like CNC machining, sheet cutting and fabrication, 3D printing, injection molding, and more, along with hundreds of materials, all in a matter of seconds. Check out Zometry today at Zometry.com. That's X-O-M-E-T-R-Y dot com. Zometry, where big ideas are built. And the secret to success is that we are consistently clear about what we're trying to do. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we have the privilege of speaking with Dora Gusias, who is a business data and technology leader with deep domain expertise in data analytics, enterprise architecture, and digital transformation. Dora has been known throughout her career as a strategic thought leader with exceptional people skills, and this will be the primary focus of our conversation today as we learn how Dora leads with empathy, transparency, and inclusiveness. Dora, thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Well, can you start by telling us a little bit, this is primarily our audience's engineers, and I'm an engineer myself. I don't fully understand what a data architect does. I mean, I think I have some general kind of nebulous idea, but can you share a little bit about what what is a data architect? What does a data architect do? You know, I don't think actually I was having this conversation not long ago with a couple of colleagues of mine, um, and I don't think there is one stereo definition for what a data architect does or how we think about it. I was speaking with a colleague, for example, that was saying, hey, within the modern cloud data stuff or analytics, somebody starts with a data engineer and then progresses to be a data architect. In my mind, a data architect is a little bit different. And when I say data architect, yes, we can talk about data architects on um, the execution and the, uh, on the execution part of things. And maybe, uh, you know, they are very close to links and mouse of an application and how perhaps to do data modeling or data architecture on a particular application. That being said, when I think of a data architect, I tend to take a step back. Think of it as a data and information architect for the at the end-to-end -end enterprise mindset. So when I'm managing, for example, enterprise data information architecture, what we do is a very techno-functional role. So it's really, yes, understanding the data, but understanding the data not in terms of the physical instantiations of it and how I can do modeling in physical, you know, in this technology or that technology, but it's more about from a data information architecture, understanding the data within business context, you know, the functional usage of it and what it means as it falls to the processes. And we're looking at things like when we look end to end processes, not just the inputs and outputs of one system or even two systems as a solution for a particular, say, initiative that has a very defined or, or finite scope. But if I look at customer, for example, if I look at customer sales, right, the end-to-end -end business process, what is the data in there? How can I streamline and simplify my end-to-end -end process? Um, am I getting the right data from the right source? A lot of it has to do with master data management. I mean, there's a lot of focus in data information architecture on master data and data governance. Do we understand the dependencies in the business needs so that we can model from, the la from a logical perspective? you know, those dependencies and relationships in the data. And those models can translate again. It could be ontology knowledge models. It could be relational models, dimensional models, right? So yes, there's the more physical and more technical side of things. But for me, an enterprise, end-to-end -end data information architect is more really about understanding the business needs and understanding the data, the relationship, the dependencies within business context and then architecting to get the most value out of that data. And just really quickly, what are one or two examples of the kinds of data sets that you work with commonly? Are we talking oh. about like 
financial data or or uh, manufacturing data or all of the above, something else entirely? All of the above. So I've actually been in IT for 29 years. I usually round it up to 30 years. And so my career, I have worked for a retailer early on. I spent a lot of time in financial services, over nine years, um, over seven years in medical technology. I've, I've been exposed to insurance, education. So throughout my career as a data and information architect, yes, it could be financial data, it could be customer data, it could be manufacturing uh, data, it could be about material, it could be about suppliers, uh, you know, all sorts of data. And it could also apply to internal data or even third-party external data that can come in, for example, and inform some of the decisions in the do analytics and so forth, or 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 mid stream in a transactional process, right? Because that's the other thing too. A lot of times when we talk about data, especially later, we talk a lot about analytics, but then we have the whole data side of things, the data management side of things, but also how they manage that within transactional processes that in the end feed and form drive analytics as well. So all types of data. Great description. Thank you for, for going through that. So you are a, a senior director in the uh, the data architecture space, which is a pretty high level position. And this, this series that we're doing right now is about leadership especially within engineering or manufacturing companies. Tell us a little bit about how, how did you get there? And maybe if you could focus your comments on what are one or two of the most influential factors that allowed you to, to climb to this position so that engineers thinking about this can, can learn from some of the, um, the, the, from the journey that you've taken. Yeah. Thank you for this question. I love this question. Um, so let me tell you a little bit actually about my background and how and how I got to this. Um, having been in IT for 29, almost 30 years, really I played every role that you can think of pretty much in SDLC. Data has always been there. I've also done enterprise architecture, software development. Data has always been there. But for me to go on to a senior director level, in my organization right now, it's about 20 billion, 50,000 people. It's a large organization. You know, what makes a difference is being able to, one, deliver outcomes, deliver solutions, even better when we deliver outcomes, right? And being able to work well with people and being able to communicate the value of what we're doing. And now, in my background, I got a technical background because, like I said, I've been a practitioner and everything that I even manage right now, I've I've done it. I've been a practitioner, but I've always thought of anything that I do with data or data engineering, data development, you know, you, different terms throughout the years, right? Um, everything I do, I do it for business value. How am I helping my business? So I've always looked at my wall. No matter really where I was in my career after the first seven or eight years, especially, it was always about how can I help my business go forward? As a business, so it's a healthier business. In other words, how do we become more agile, cut down costs? How do we mitigate risk? How do I help better manage uh, data or provide more resilient solutions that are going to cost us less overall, but also, you know, open up new opportunities to work with our customers, while well, our customers, for example, which means happier customers, happier business, right? So on the revenue side. So for me, I've always been a, a leg, I like to say, nineteen, a leg in the business because everything I do on the technical side, I have to understand the functional side of things and how it helps my business. And so what has really differentiated in my career, I think, and helped me get to where I am in my career is the ability to relate with people and understand what their pain points are, what's in it for them. And then deliver, work with them collaboratively, pull on my technical and engineering and data skills to deliver resilient solutions that really tie directly to customer value or streamlined operations or, you know, some sort of really adding business value, meaning I am addressing a pain point, I'm making it better. Um, you know, I'm working collaboratively to open up new opportunities 
for for the organization, right? So it's not about the technology. It's not about the data. It's about how I help my business and how I communicate about it. And there's more I can say here, but I'm, let me pause to hear your thoughts. And uh, you said so have... many things that I, I really love. There, I'd like to uh, discuss just a couple of them in more detail. One of the things you said was not just being able to do the work, but being able to talk about the work in a way that helps others understand the value that it's creating, which is effectively marketing. And I think that's a skill that very few engineers have, very few, maybe just professionals generally have, right? You might be the best practitioner out there, but if if you don't know how to, and in some cases, organically, the results are going to speak for themselves. But if you can develop a few skills around marketing to better communicate the value that you're bringing, I think that's really, really important. Some might say it's egotistical, but I think it's just good business, right, for the individual. And then the other thing that you mentioned, which I would love for you to elaborate on just a little bit, is you talked about the difference between um, delivering solutions versus outcomes. Can you talk about the difference between those, please? Yes. Before we go to solutions versus outcomes, I, I want to comment a little bit on your comment about marketing and sales, and that is true. And yes, like people might think of this verse as egotistical, but let me just tell you a little story. Many, many years ago, somebody said this to me, and that stuck with me. And it was, uh, yeah, I was talking to this person, and she was describing the great work somebody else was doing in the team, but that person was doing awesome work. Really good, forward thinking. Nobody knew about it. So what she said and it stuck with me is, it is not enough to do great work. Because if nobody knows that you're doing this great work, not only is this not helping you in terms of your career and navigating your career, it's not helping the rest of the organization to say, hey, here's how well it did value hear about it, maybe there's an opportunity similar or something that we can expand in this other functional area when this can bring value to you as well. Which is why I don't think about this as egotistical because when you actually say, and now in terms of how it's adding value, again, this is not, this is not about being arrogant or egotistical. Sales and marketing, it's really, I think of it more in terms of communicating, communication and less about sales and marketing, meaning how do I articulate this work? Again, it's not enough to do great work. If people don't know about it, then there's a very small percentage of value we get out of that work. The value can really explore when in a, in a, in a constructive way. We can articulate and communicate and say, this process was breaking. You know, we will now give you an example. Um, we miss shipping product out. But, you know, we work with your XYZ and we were able to alleviate that pain. And next time, you know, we're being proactive, it's not going to happen. That XYZ tax that we did, it could be, for example, proactively looking at the integrity quality of the data. You know, what was it that cost, for example, not shipping our product? Maybe it was because the data was not good. Maybe it was missing. Maybe it was confusing. The, the, the position was confusing, right? Whatever it is, we did something. To now not only fix this right now, but maybe proactively avoid that. That's adding value, right? So how do we say, not in an elegant way, not in an in-your-face way, but hey, great, we saved that much time, we proactively were able to meet our customers' needs, whatever the value is within the within the example, by doing XYZ. Somebody else might hear that say, oh, you know what? We had a similar problem. Can you help me here? Really? You can look at the data this way? Really? You know this person and you guys thought about this, this uh, resolution that you figured out? Can you put me in contact? So what does this do? Number one, it highlights, again, the value of the systems and what we bring to the table without you saying, look at me, I've done all this work. It's, again, more about how do we help the organization or the other person or the other team until that helps spread the wealth. Um, and say, how do you help? And, and I'm going to say one other thing here. Then we'll go back to the solutions versus outcomes. Being able to articulate and communicate what helps with that, what has helped me with that for my career is really knowing who I'm talking to. 
So if I want to communicate about the great work my team is doing, I'm going to talk about it to my finance person in relation to a finance um, situation, a pain point or an opportunity that finance will understand, right? Based on what they're doing, their day-to-day -day process or whatever the person I'm talking to. But if I'm talking to someone that's on a manufacturing plant and they're doing today for a process, it's around different niches, different situations, I'm going to use an example to showcase the value that they can understand. I'm not going to talk about finance. And if I talk to sales, you know, field, sales people out in the field, I'm going to bring up an example that resonates with them. I'm not going to talk about, you know, what legal is trying to do, for example. So that is something that does help in the how you navigate the career back to your original question, right? Because adding value is not a theoretical thing. It's not an abstract thing. It's the real tangible thing, connecting it to value, but also make sure situational awareness, what are you talking to and articulate or communicate, I should say, in a way that that audience understands what it is that you're talking about, which means this. It means that for me to be able to communicate better, the onus then is on me to understand my audience. So if I'm talking to an operations person or a marketing person or a sales or a finance person, before I go into that situation, I want to understand more about their function, especially if I'm trying to, quote unquote, sell something. A lot of what I'm doing is forward thinking, for example, and it involves a lot of transformation, driving change in the organization. So again, that is a technique and a tool that I've used, which puts the onus on me before I talk to my procurement person, hey, what does it mean to do procurement? What, what are the challenges that this person or this stakeholder or this function comes across when they're looking to negotiate with suppliers, for example, right? So again, educating myself that arms me with better tools and context for me to better communicate the value of the work that we're doing. And that not only helps my team and my function that I manage as, as a functional you know, leader in the data space, but it also just makes me more valuable as well because then people understand where I'm coming from, what I'm saying, and, you know, they can reach out and pull on that value. And I haven't forgotten about your other question, but I do want to make this, this point here because <laughs> I think it's very important. Great. Yeah, let's move on to the solutions versus outcomes now. The simplest way for me to think about that is this. It is not about keeping busy. So it's always about do we know where we want to go? What are those goals and objectives? And oh, by the way, the goal should not be I'm going to do data engineering because I'm going to try out this new data engineering or whatever type of engineering practice or technology, right? I'm not going to do data for the sake of data. I'm not going to do engineering or architecture or technology for the sake of that technology and so forth. What is my goal? Does it relate back to, is it customer value? Is it, you know, um, business value? Is it patient value? Is it, how does it relate back to company strategic objectives that we're trying to go? Now, once I know that, that's actually going to help me to make sure that I'm delivering outcomes, not just keeping busy. So solution, I can put a solution out there, but is it the right solution? Is it really what we need right now? And even if it is, how do I make sure that I draw it with the, with the perspective of how is this helping my business stakeholders or, you know, my internal or external customers, patients, and so forth. That actually, I found, it makes, it's a very solid difference versus, hey, I'm going to do all this work today. Great. I've worked for eight hours, 10 hours, whatever it is. I've kept busy. But how, what was the impact from that? So solution versus outcome for me is the value add. And for that to be value add, not just basic work, I have to be very clear as to what is my target. Do we all understand that target now consistently? Because that's another key point that I think has helped me in my career. And I think technical and engineering uh, 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 ask people who don't always, you know, it doesn't always resonate. Sometimes we're getting on with, hey, let me prove this other engineer or this other technical or this other data practice. Let me talk about 
mesh versus fabric in my data architecture world, for example. Let me talk about Gen AI versus, I don't know, machine learning. Let me talk about, you know, the CDP platform versus the data lake or the data lake house. That's a technical jargon, you know? I, so it's not about the technical jargon and it's not about me doing the wrong just to implement those things. Unless again, it's the right things to implement at this time and we know that only, we, only when we know where we're going and we get everybody marched towards, towards common goals. As part of communication, I think one of the misunderstandings uh, and one of the traps that we fall in is that we think if they say something, um, that the other person understands the same. I mean, how many times, right? Or can you imagine yourself being in a meeting? I know I have. I've been there many times and it's been a lesson learned for me. Being in a meeting, talking about things, people stating things and walk away, the things to do and walk away from the meeting and then it's like, wait, what exactly am I supposed to do? What does that mean? Or then starting down the path, coming back for the next meeting or the next touch point and realizing, oh, wait a minute, I feel this is what we're doing. Well, I feel this is what we're doing. So communication, again, clarity around communication and just really taking the time to ask the question and say, hey, here's how I understand it. Is this how you understand it? We're making assumptions. We're making assumptions. I was in a, I'll give you a very quick example. Many, many, many years ago, I was in a conversation talking to my business stakeholders and we were doing to do analytics and it had to do with, you know, bringing in a lot of the, of the data and trying to look at um, where the product, where the inventory was in the company, right? Uh, how much of it, where it was, was it tying from a dollar value back to the financials as well, and you had statutory calls, management calls, you had different calls. And people sometimes are even uh, shy to say, well, what do you mean by that? Or everybody, people might say, I don't want to ask what that means because people might think, oh, I don't know my stuff or I'm coming across, I don't know, as a non-smart person. So they might be shy. And what I've learned over my career, and this is something that I was doing earlier on, is being shy to ask questions and making the assumption that everybody else knows better than me or that everybody else understands what this means, but I'm not very clear. Turns out, once I ask the question and being curious about it, not only are we not thinking about it the same way, we're very far apart sometimes. And turns out the example that was gave me, that gave, gave him, some of those terms was just nomenclature. It wasn't accounting terms out there in the industry. It was just very local nomenclature that that team had put together and it becomes so much part of the lingo where you think, oh gosh, maybe that's an interesting term out there. And I don't know what it is. I'm going to go Google it. And maybe they'll find it out there, but it might be something totally different. Not exactly what in this dynamic, in this case, in this organization, how it's been understood here. So I would say as part of communication, again, make sure to get that clarity. I've had similar situations where... I think to myself, oh, I don't have anything important to add here. Everyone already knows the things I'm thinking. And then I'll start sharing them anyway. And I'll realize, oh, they, they didn't know that. Or uh, this point was not clear to everyone else. So um, sometimes it can be, it almost feels a little uncomfortable because you feel like maybe everyone else in the room is so much smarter than you are. Uh, but then you, you start speaking and realize, oh, well, I mean, smart can mean a lot of different things. And I actually do have some really valuable insight that I can share with the, with the team, um, which I think that, that that's a good lead into um, the next question. But before I get into that, I want to bring up really quickly your point about solutions versus outcomes. I worked with an engineer in the past who was technically brilliant. I mean, this engineer was very, very skilled from a technical standpoint. He could do things that other engineers just couldn't do. And how do I phrase this? What we learned in the end was that it was not a good fit working together, not because he wasn't technically skilled enough, but because he was more focused on solutions rather than outcomes. And there were so many times when he would put together this just technically amazing solution, which was really cool, right? Any engineer would look at it and be like, wow, that is so cool. That's amazing that you were able to do this but it was not necessary. It wasn't something the customer had asked for. In some cases, it was something customer had specifically said, don't work on this. So there is a, a, a very 
significant business value to understanding the difference there between solutions versus outcomes. Uh, I, so, I think so, yes. <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. Going, uh, so we were talking about um, this, this uh, uh, I'll, I'll just call it imposter syndrome. This is something mm. that I certainly have experienced in the past, right? You're in the room and, oh, I shouldn't be here. Everyone else is so much smarter than I am. I, I don't really have anything to, to contribute to the group. Have you ever experienced that, especially as you have grown and climbed, uh, climbed the ranks as a leader into higher and higher leadership positions? Have you ever experienced that imposter syndrome? And how have you managed that throughout your career? Absolutely, many times. Um, I mean, if I didn't experience it, that means that I don't grow. I keep on doing the same thing, not stretching, not growing. It's actually, incidentally, about two weeks ago, I went to a TEDx event, TEDx Ocala, and one of the uh, folks that was speaking on there was talking about that, and he put this idea, what spread in, apparently, uh, at TEDx, saying, hey, what if imposter syndrome is actually not a bad thing, as so many of us by default get a thing? What if it actually really means that I'm being uncomfortable because I'm stretching, I'm pushing myself into a of something new. And what's so bad about that? We keep on growing, stretching something new, right? So it's 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 looking at imposter syndrome almost in a different light. And I'm not doing justice to the person's idea, but yes, I, it's probably not even on TED.com yet because it was just a couple of weeks ago, but you know, we can search for it later. But the simple answer is yes, and it goes, I, I, I'll give you this example. I can visualize myself back in the 90s, being in a meeting room, almost like a boardroom around the table, and exactly what you said, Aaron, I, I was shy. I was keeping back. I had all these questions, and I made this assumption that everybody else knew better than me. I'll come across as being done if I ask a question, and I wouldn't ask the question. Turns out throughout the conversation, yeah, no, other people didn't really understand it as much. I was overestimating other folks' knowledge or abilities, underestimating mine, because what is being smart being anyway? It, but simply for me, being smart is not that I have the biggest knowledge, right? In my mind, being smart means I use what I have and I drive an outcome. You know, I figure it out. I work with the right folks. I know who to reach out to. I know how to communicate to them. I know where I can quickly, you know, leverage other folks' expertise, surround myself with the right people, bring expertise myself, we work together, we get good things done, right? That, in my mind, is an interpretation of being smart. Now that I know everything, Especially this time and age where you can just Google everything or chat GPT everything and you get some kind of an answer. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so what happened over the years, the last thing realized that I'm 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 really assuming that everybody else knows about this particular topic a lot more than me or a lot better. I started asking questions more and I realized that led to better conversations and it led to better success with the projects because Asking the question opened up the dialogue, and then you see that other people also have gaps in the knowledge or, or misunderstanding things differently. And in some cases, it's not that you have a gap or that you don't understand, but that you understand it differently. And the secret to success is that we are consistently clear about what we're trying to do, which means we need to understand the goals the same way and know who does what, how we work together, where to go to. The lack of clarity is, I think, um, you know, a, a critical to us not, not being successful, right? So right now, so over the years, that got more and more comfortable. So right now, as a leader, I actually, by design, sometimes ask one, people might think it's a dumb question because I do that just to also show and in a subtle way, almost, kind of like, quote-unquote, give permission to all the people to open up and ask questions. Because I know we get to better clarity, better conversations, better designs, better solutions, where we're going to put on the diversity of thought and expertise and we'll bring that to the table and, you know, we'll work better together, as I like to say, which I believe it. So it's almost as if me being in a leadership role, asking that seemingly dumb question, I know what I'm doing. I'm opening it up for other people to also ask that question. 
And again, down this to better conversations. I love that. I, I have a friend who does the same thing. He's a, a, a leader in the space and he calls those McDonald's questions. And I'll explain what that means. He says, occasionally they'll go out to lunch, you know, part uh, as a team, you know, whatever the group is at, at the company. And someone will ask, well, where should we go? And nobody wants to speak up and say, oh, we should go to this restaurant or we should go to that restaurant. So he'll, in his opinion, pick the the worst restaurant out there and say, we should go here. And so his go-to is usually, oh, let's go to McDonald's. Well, nobody <laughs> wants to go to McDonald's. But after that suggestion, any restaurant seems like a great choice. <laughs> And that's his way of, of opening things up, McDonald's questions. Well, let me take just a very short break here and share with the listeners that our company, Pipeline Design and Engineering, develops new and innovative manufacturing processes for complex products that implements them into manual fixtures or fully automated machines to dramatically reduce production costs and improve production yields for OEMs. And today we're speaking with Dora Busias and learning a little bit about her leadership journey and the uh, the, the drives or the changes that she has uh, brought to fruition at the companies for whom she has worked. Um, Dora, what you had this really neat experience when you came to the United States many years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, and then that that kind of brought home the growth that you've been able to achieve over the years with, with a, a recent ish experience. And I think, you know what I'm talking about. Can you, can you share that experience with us? Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I appreciate the kind comments too. I, I know what you're referring to. So last year, um, I was nudged to, uh, to, to write an article for a magazine and I did write it. Um, and it was, published in CIO Review, the magazine. The article actually was about data was on your way to being data-driven up for you then stop pitfalls. But what happened, I did not know, is that it didn't just publish. Apparently, it made the cover story of the ECM uh, edition of the magazine. And one day, I got the actual print copy of the magazine in the mail. And as I was holding it, I, I, and it was a surprise. I didn't actually know. So it was great to get the magazine. But as I was looking at this, I saw my words on the cover page. And then opening it up, it was a spread cover story. And in just in a very split second, uh, it took me by surprise. But as I saw my words on the on the cover page, it pretty much brought me back almost 34 years ago in 1989 in February. This is when I came to the United States. And this particular instance really brought tears to my eyes at the total blindside because I could hardly speak English when I came to the United States. I mean, I came here to go to college. Yes, I had taken the lower uh, exam and I had passed it with a grade of C, might I say. <laughs> so I just made it that I wasn't proud of it. But when I came here, however, my AI was not trained, so I could hardly understand what anybody was telling me. I had started studying English when I was about 14. It was out of books. It was listening to the British accent. It was a little bit different. My AI wasn't trained. It was just out of cassette tapes. And um, and so going from that, and I call how hard it was those days. I mean, it took me, I think, the first three months. I don't think I uttered anything else other than, hello, goodbye. Thank you. You know, I, I landed in GFK. I went to Warbury, Connecticut. And back then, I was referring to it as Waterbury, Connecticut. This is how I was enunciating. This is how I was speaking. So you can imagine how much harder time I had to get used to understanding what people were telling me. So, so yes, from that to now, 34 years later, seeing my was printed even on a cover page or just even running an article and having it published, it was it was a big moment for me. And and then what I also thought, and yes, you saw that story because I shared about that story, right? And I have a little quick eight minute uh, video on LinkedIn. What I thought at that moment is, hey, maybe this is the story somebody wants to hear because to get from there to hear how it happened, was many tiny little steps. And that was the message that I wanted to get out. Not about the fact that, hey, I wrote an article and it's out there. I mean, I did that. Just these are my lessons. If I can help anyone, you know, if these resonate and somebody can be inspired or learn from those lessons in implementing successfully data strategy program, then great. That's what I wanted to do. 
which was a byproduct. I wasn't expecting it. But the, now the fact is that to get from there, the 17-year-old girl that could hardly understand anything to here, it was really putting in the work, being resilient, you know, and taking many little steps. It's falling down, getting up, going in it again, and realizing that it's not one big jump. I do this right now in my role for so many years. I'm driving enterprise level, you know, uh, enterprise wide change. And I know to expect pushback, and I know it's not going to happen all the time because, especially large organizations, it's like a big ship. It takes a while to steer. So when I'm bringing something forward, thinking about data information architecture, about all these things that we want to do versus just go and build something instead of, well, let's thoughtfully think about this end to end and make sure that we're not just building a solution, but we're building a resilient solution that will still be here and around and us using it still next year, not trying to fix why we did not do by the first time. There's a different way of thinking and doing that I'm speaking about. So that's really driving change. And I know it's not going to happen overnight. So it's the same kind of mindset and the same kind of practicing it every day. One little win, one little step at a time. And it adds up. And think about it, right? If at the end of the year, we usually take stock of what happened in the year, right? And then New Year comes, we're getting to it and we do resolutions, right? But at the end of the year, we usually look back at the year. We look back at the five years, right? And sometimes, tell me if you think otherwise, but for me, I look back, I'm like, oh, wow, that's been quite a progress. Or even these 34 years, my example, right? That's quite a difference. Well, it wasn't on big jump. It was doing the work, showing up. Every time, and just taking tiny little steps that just keep on adding to each other. That's terrific. Yeah, that's such an inspirational story and, and just shows what consistent hard work could do. We have some tenets that we hang up at the wall at Pipeline, and one of them is persistence beats brilliance. And brilliance is great as well, but I think persistence, 99 times out of 100, it's the persistent person that succeeds and maybe one time out of 100, you really do need that truly brilliant person. But 99 times out of 100, as long as you're, you know, some minimal level of smart, whatever smart means or tons of definitions right. of that. But as long as you have that minimum viable smart, it's the persistent person that wins in the end that, that really succeeds. I could look at more. And, and, and I would add also knowing how to work with other folks because that is important. Because as I like to say sometimes, no one of us is a lone island. Not as a person, not as a function. So I'm always talking about how do we partner, collaborate, build that trust, that pour that credibility with our stakeholders, internal and external. That's what's really also helping. Um, showing up, being consistent, and, and uh, knowing how to work with other folks as well. Absolutely. Well, Tell us a little bit about some of the some of the biggest challenges that you encounter as a leader. Uh, well, for me as a leader, um, there's a couple of different dimensions to it, right? First of all, from the business function side of things, I want to make sure that I do everything I can to make the right impact, to work on the right things, to work as best as I can with folks to reinforce to again make sure that we prioritize the right things at that point in time for the organization that it aligns to strategic objectives and I help shape our goals, you know, with my team and what we're doing and how it fits with the rest of the organization. So from that aspect of you know the leader role, that's something that um, I'm always uh, very cognizant about. The other aspect of it, which is equally, if not Triggering some, you know, it's it's an either gray, right? Uh, sometimes this takes over, sometimes the other one, it's a little more um, uh, fun of mine. But it is, I would say, equally in the long term, uh, long uh, run, important for me is the people management aspect of it. And it's not so much about the people management, I mean, people management, but also just talent. I'm making sure that I attract, I bring in to the team the right talent that will integrate all of the rest of the team and the organization that I do everything I can to create opportunities for my team to help them 
navigate their career, to be a coach, to be a mentor, to um, uh, just make sure that depending, I can advocate for them, I can sponsor them, I can help them. You know, this whole mentality to that I'm talking about, not just as a leader, but just the driving change or being, and I talk a lot about empathetic leadership, right? It's all about what, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Be that, being somebody that is part of my team and reports up to me. So how can I help you, you know, this person, to make sure that they're working on the right things, that they're getting... Uh, you know, that, that they're doing good work, they're feeling accomplished, they're being acknowledged, that it helps them again progress in their career because that's what will make me the happiest, making sure that, hey, I had a positive impact in this person's life and I help them from a career perspective to to do better. Uh, so how, what can I do for you, you know, as a as a people manager and again, as a function, what can I, how can I help you with your know, different stakeholders, different functions, the organization, so forth. So it generally about the other side, not about me. And that's really, I guess, back to your original question, now that I'm thinking about it, Aaron, that I guess it's one of those reasons that has definitely contributed to me being where I am right now, right? Almost thinking about how can I help bring value? How can I help you, whoever that you is, right? The person, the function, like I said. Um, yeah. This is even the reason why I'm even here on this podcast, because I started talking on podcast very organically. Somebody reached out and that led to more, but I'm doing that for no reason other than, hey, if I can share some of my lessons to help out, that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for doing this. I heard a quote once a long time ago that really resonated with me and is aligned very much with what you just said. The quote was, the best way to get what you want in life is to help others get what they want. And I've found that to be very, very true. You know, that is so true and that is so good because I don't want to give the wrong impression out to what happens when I share because I say, hey, if anybody can can learn from this, great. In the end, I end up learning more. And I'm not just saying this because just as talking here right now, I've learned from you. I'm learning from every person that I come across. If I go to a conference, for example, I make it a point to capitalize on my time there, to connect with people, not to connect with a whole lot of people, but the people that I connect, it's more about quality, not quantity, is making sure, again, that it's a true and authentic connection, and I listen, and I learn from the other person. Because when I'm sharing, and especially if I'm sharing in terms of how can I help you, what ends up happening the other side starts sharing than what they know, their experiences. And this is diversity of experience of thoughts that I have knowledge before because it comes from somebody else. So again, in the end, it helps my light bulbs go off as well <laughs> and just keep on growing and running as a, as a human being and as a leader. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've been in the, the medical device space for a number of years now. What are some challenges that you see facing medical device companies these days? You know, I don't know that it's specific to medical device, to be honest. And I've, like I said, I've been exposed to many different industries and I'm very active talking to colleagues across different industries. So I don't know that this, what, I've, what I'm seeing is very specific to medical device. I think all of us need to get really comfortable and really effective, efficient even with managing change. It's the only custom really. Things constantly changing. Maybe it's COVID that hits us out of the blue. Maybe it's the fact that, I don't know, there's a mess in the world and that impacts operations, right, and people. Maybe it's the fact that technology is advancing so quickly. I mean, we all know, everybody's talking about chat GPT and what it's doing right now, right? And all of a sudden, we're talking more than ever before about AI governments. You know, that is impacting not only medical device companies, but any organization out there. So for me, the biggest challenge is that staying relevant, staying competitive, making sure that as the competition, because of the change, becomes more and more fierce, that means that we then need to be very good at housekeeping, so to speak, that we're being efficient, that we can scale, that we're agile in what we're doing, that we're adding value as we're doing all of that. Actually, 
And the outcome of us being able to be to scale up a new job means that we are adding value to our customers and our and our patients, right? Because that means I can get my product out that much quicker. And in my case, medical technology right now, healthcare, it could save somebody lives, right? Or make their life a lot easier, depending on, on the device or equipment that we're talking about. Um, and then how do we integrate all these advancements to, to, you know, do bigger and better things? You know, like, for example, some of our products are still using AI that are actually creating new uh, uh, new products to help our, our, our patients. And I'll give you an example. One of our products, for example, right now, work for Striker, was using AI and looking at how much blood is in the sponge. Just by holding the sponge in front of one of the products, holding a sponge, which is a medical sponge that could have blood all over, right, as the surgeons are using it, in front of an image, you know, image recognition, and that could come back and tell me how much blood, which could be an indication of, is this person bleeding too much? During this operation, that could be life saving. That's just an idea, right? One of the products. So, how do we also use these new capabilities, new technology uh, to do better things? And through all of that, there are the challenges that I see, not only again in my industry, but in all industries. And I truly believe this it's realizing that always everything goes back to people. So, even with the technology and everything, how do we now lose um, sign of the fact that how we work with each other and back to having those clear goals, that clarity in communication and targets, not thinking about the technologies, that sort of bullet that will solve everything. It all goes back to us people and how we work together because even with all the latest technology, that human in the loop, as they say, right, it's necessary. And, and how we understand, collaborate, partner, and make things happen with each other. I think we tend to forget that, generally speaking, across the industries. So to me, that's a challenge to keep that front of mind. Absolutely. Well said. I think we'll just do one more question and then we'll wrap things up here. A lot of the people who are listening to this podcast are doing so because they have a growth mindset. They want to progress. They want to grow in their careers. What are some things that you think maybe are specific to technical individuals such as engineers and as far as their growth, what are some practices or skills or behaviors that you think engineers and technical professionals need to develop to really differentiate themselves and grow in their careers? Uh, thanks for the question, Aaron. I think it relates to some of the um, conversation that we had. I would say, I always say, know your craft. Your engineer, whatever type of, you know, technical subject matter expertise, know your craft. That's why table stakes. But from there on, never stop learning. And learning, growth my sentence, it's great. Learning includes learning, again, how to communicate, how to showcase that, hey, this is bringing value. Being curious, asking questions. To me, those are the kinds of differentiators. Uh, that's something that I do in the to sleep, by the way. Um, everybody that knows me knows that I'm not just passionate about the work that I do, but I'm always very curious and always learning. Those things have helped me. I think they help differentiate. So know your craft, but also don't forget it's not just about the technical. Don't, bring jar don't speak jargon when you speak to your stakeholders. Speak in simple English terms, relating it to how it's going to help your stakeholder. And keep on learning because I'm going to say this one uh, thing um, that a friend of mine said not long ago and it stuck with me. I talk about a lot about change and I realize sometimes people, maybe not the audience here with a growth mindset, but sometimes we forget or other people um, don't like the change, right? Maybe there's a little pushback. And what I think is that that's really the only constant, right? It's going to happen. It's like a way of life. You can't skip over change. You just, we just, we just can't. It's going to happen. And a friend of mine a while back said, well, you know, standing still, it's really going backwards. Standing still, it's really going backwards because everything else around us keeps moving forward. So even though I'm standing still, Maybe I want to keep on doing things the way that I was always doing. Maybe it's too much work for me to realize when I speak to my operations persons versus my salesperson, you know, oh, what are the different pain points? Maybe it's just a lot easier for me to just 
go and speak at it from my, you know, technical subject matter ex expertise and just throw a whole bunch of technical jargon. But that's not going to help us much as these other things that we talked about. So we can push back, we can stay where we are. But everybody else around us is changing. So don't stay still, be curious, ask questions. Don't forget about how to more effectively communicate. And of course, always know your stuff and deliver. I love that. So many great uh, catchphrases there. Um, standing still is moving backwards. And oh, there's another one that you, you oh, the only constant is change. Terrific. It made me think of, uh, well, the statement about standing still is moving backwards. Just another way to talk about that. If you're, if you're training a muscle, if you're at the gym, right, you're lifting weights, and you're doing, let's say, 10 reps for four sets of whatever, bench press or something. If you do the same thing every time, the 10 reps of the bench press, four sets, it actually gets harder to do over time. It's not until you start pushing yourself to do more than you did last time that you start building the muscle. And I think that's a great analogy for a lot of things in life. I think that's a great analogy as well, yes. See, I told you, Aaron, us talking, I'm learning from you. This is why it's great. Go out there, share the work. It actually pays back. So thank you. I love it. Well, Dora, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. What a delightful conversation it's been. I've loved hearing your stories and hearing the insights that you have shared with us all. Is there anything else that you'd like to say before we end the show? Any uh, Anything else that we haven't touched on that you think needs to get out there? Just that I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the conversation. And if uh, anyone listening has any questions, wants to reach out, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always approachable and we can, you know, uh, continue the conversation there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dora. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you like what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.